What I want to finish with today is trying to incorporate this into a fuel cell design. About a week ago or so, I showed you a spreadsheet model for an SOFC system where we looked at thermal integration involving hydrogen as a fuel. So we're taking hydrogen and air, we're using waste heat from the fuel cell to preheat the incoming air and fuel. I've basically taken that same model and now I've modified it to work with methane. The way I've done that is to take this equilibrium calculation that I just showed you in the other spreadsheet and I've just built it in. So here's what the process looks like to see, sort of understand the topography. So we're taking the exhaust from the afterburner and we're using that, we're splitting that to do a preheat of the air, just like we had before. And before we took some of that, a very small, less than 10% portion of that exhaust, and we used it to preheat the incoming hydrogen. You might remember that. Instead, we're feeding that exhaust to a reformer. This reformer, I've drawn it as a heat exchanger because it kind of is like one. We take the methane, we mix it with steam. So here's a steam generator, which I'll come back to. Pump it into the reformer as a gas, and then we heat it with this part of the exhaust. The reforming reaction is endothermic. So we need some source of thermal energy. If we just have a packed bed reactor, then the gases are going to cool off a lot as they go through the packed bed reactor and the reforming reaction happens. So instead, this is a heated reactor. It's like a heat exchanger, but with catalyst in it. So the gases come in, they're passing from one end to the other. They're being heated up actually by the ex outgoing exhaust. And also the exhaust is providing the necessary energy for the gases to come to reaction equilibrium. Hopefully this pre-reformer has enough catalyst in it and a long enough residence time. Stream five should come out in equilibrium at whatever temperature we're specifying. So if we want to run this thing at like 550 going into the fuel cell, what we have to do is calculate the equilibrium of the steam methane reforming reaction at 550C uh, with whatever steam and methane we put in. We also take preheated air and feed that into the fuel cell, probably at the same temperature. So here's our incoming gases at 550, just like we had before. They go through the fuel cell, cathode gases get um, heated, the anode gases also get heated, and there's internal reforming. So the gases come out now at a higher temperature, maybe 750, if that's the operating temperature of our fuel cell, they are still gonna be in equilibrium with each other. So there'll be a, may be a little methane left, depending on how hot we get in the fuel cell. Hopefully we drive that concentration very low because we're using up the hydrogen as we go through the fuel cell. And we're constantly by Le Chatelier's principle, continuously pulling the CH4 back to, you know, to hydrogen and CO, and then we're burning the hydrogen and CO. And so hopefully there's very little methane that slips out. Whatever is left, you know, depending on the utilization, 80% utilization, for example, we would then burn the rest and make CO2 and water. That's the exhaust, and that's what we're doing, doing the preheating with. The last step here, I'm assuming that we're going to do something with the waste heat. Part of it now we're using for reforming, but that doesn't use up all the heat. We also generate some thermal energy depending on the utilization. And that's coming out, as it turns out, at around 200 C. Stream 14, there's a little bit left of thermal energy. The last thing we do with it is boil the water. So the water comes in at 20 C as a liquid, and we're vaporizing it using the last bits of thermal energy that are contained in the exhaust. That's the topography of the process. So the material balances, I think, are fairly straightforward, provided we can solve the equilibria. Coming out of the reformer, I'm assuming equilibrium. So we've got an equilibrium calculation for stream five. And we also have a remaining fuel that we haven't burned, and we have to calculate that equilibrium. So these two streams, five and seven, we have to do the same calculation that I just showed you uh, in the other spreadsheet. And that's what this section is. So basically, I'm doing, I'm looking at streams five and seven, specifying the temperature. I'm picking that to, in this case, to be 750. It's coming out in stream six and seven. And my feed is 550. And just like before, I'm adjusting the airflow to provide the necessary cooling. So because these two temperatures are specified, it's fairly straightforward to calculate directly the equilibria uh, in streams five and seven. And then once that's done, you can do the material balance for the rest of the process um, and then do the energy balances as we had before. Just to show you what this looks like, if we look at stream five, at 550 degrees, which is one of the temperatures we've been looking at for the hydrogen fuel cell, we have only about 10% of the stream is, is actually methane because a lot of it is being converted to other stuff. Hydrogen ends up being 44%. CO is 3%. 
remaining CH4 is 10%. We may produce 9% carbon dioxide and 34% water, partly because we put in a bunch of water because we have a certain steam to carbon ratio. We're trying to prevent the Boudard reaction and any precipitation of carbon. So the, the actual amount of methane left over is actually relatively small. Um, the CO and hydrogen burn readily in the fuel cell. And then when we come out, depends on the fuel utilization, but if I pick 80% fuel utilization, um, this is what comes out. We still have about 11% hydrogen remaining and uh, methane is very small because we're at a much higher temperature when we come out of the fuel cell. So by the time we actually, the fuel leaves, there's, the methane is basically all gone. We've converted all of it to hydrogen and CO, most of which if we've consumed, and we have maybe 12 or 13%, 14% fuel remaining uh, inside this gas. The rest of it's all carbon dioxide and water. Burn up the rest in the afterburner, and we just end up with CO2 and water. And the temperature of stream eight is about 900 degrees. Um, so we go from an exit temperature of 750 up to a final exhaust temperature of 900 due to this additional combustion. Obviously, if we go to higher utilization, then that temperature difference is smaller. As we go to lower utilization, we're doing more afterburning, then that temperature difference becomes greater. So just to walk you through the rest of this, this is very, very similar to the spreadsheet I've already shown you where we're working with hydrogen, but we are adding more molecular species. So over here on the left, here's my thermodynamic table, and I have added to it solid carbon, carbon monoxide, the methane, carbon dioxide. In this problem, I'm also worried a little bit with about liquid water because uh, I need to think about the, the condensation of the steam in the exhaust. Conceptually, this is the same thing. We're, to just think about the order of events, we've specified the inlet and outlet temperature to the stack. So the first thing the spreadsheet does, does all these energy balances in sequence. So first I do an energy balance around the stack to determine uh, the airflow needed to maintain constant temperature. The once I do that, uh, we know we can solve the afterburner energy balance. That tells us the exit temperature in stream eight. So now we have the temperatures of stream eight, nine, and 10. Once we know those temperatures, then we can do energy balances around the heat exchanger and the pre-reformer. Um, we know everything coming in. We know everything uh, going out except for streams 11 and 12. So we solve for the temperature of the exhaust coming out of streams 11 and 12. That also gives us the temperature of stream 13. Uh, and then finally, I have a, I've added a heat exchanger here. Um, this is sort of to help with thinking about how much excess thermal energy we have remaining. Um, and then anything that I don't reject through the secondary heat exchanger, um, that gets consumed in, right here where we're boiling the water. So we start with liquid water, and that's why so we need the thermodynamics here. The six, stream 16, I'm assuming I'm coming in with liquid water and I need to boil it. And we're not going to just heat that electrically. We're going to try to use some of the waste heat from our stack to be able to do that. So the last thing I do is after I take all the thermal energy and I recycle it here, and then I get rid of some here, the last step is to boil the water. And I have to boil it and superheat it enough excess thermal energy to make sure that none of the liquid precipitates in stream four. So an additional constraint that I've added is that I want stream four to be minimally uh, 100 degrees C. I get a little bit excess. So I set it at 120 because I want to make sure that I'm not going to condense any liquid moisture going into the pre-reformer. So, so this, if stream four is at 120, um, that means seven, stream 17 has to be hotter than 120 because the methane is only at 20 degrees. Uh, so this ends up being, I think, 164 degrees. So, so, so we need to boil. We also need to do a little bit of superheating. Uh, at this heat exchanger. One subtlety about this heat exchanger is bringing this exhaust in. One of the combustion products of all this is water. So what's going to happen? I'm at one atmosphere of pressure and I lower the temperature of stream 14 down, 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 down. So this, this stream could condense and start making some liquid water. Go our goal is actually to make, to maximize the amount of liquid water that leaves in the exhaust, because that means we've We've pulled all the thermal energy we possibly can 
out of this exhaust and make it potentially useful for something. So there's actually a pinch in this heat exchanger. Let me just draw this up on the board for a second. So imagine I have a heat exchanger of countercurrent heat exchange. And I think about the temperature profile of two gas streams. So this is gases only. Let's say I come in at one this temperature and I'm decreasing the temperature of one stream. So it comes in at this temperature, goes out at this temperature. This, this is the temperature axis. My other stream comes in like this and it's heating up. This is a relatively simple situation because I have monotonic increases or decreases in temperature, but we think about our current situation. It's a little more complicated because we're coming in with uh, liquid water, which is at 20 degrees. And so the first thing that we're going to do is heat the water up. But once we heated the water up to hundred degrees, it's going to boil. And then once it's done boiling, then it can go up in temperature as a gas. So the profile looks a little bit more like this, where it's going up. It's going flat and 100 degrees, and then it's heating up to whatever temperature we're exiting with. Meanwhile, the gas that is doing all this, it starts out as a gas, but then somewhere along the line, some of the water starts to precipitate out of it. And when that happens, it's going to go flat because we're just, it's a condenser at that point. So our profile coming down the other way looks kind of like this. I get to a certain point, and then this goes flat because it hits 100 C. This is 100 C and this is 100 C. Those two are both at the same temperature. So the way I've drawn it actually can't work, right? Because I'm gonna have a point in the middle of this heat exchanger where the two temperatures become equal and then the surface area goes to infinity. That's called a pinch point. So what we have to do is arrange this in such a way with the right flow rates and temperatures and, and difference in temperature between the gases that that pinch never actually occurs. So for example, our profile needs to look something more like this, where we come in, we heat the water to 100 C, we can cool the gas past this pinch point somewhere, and then it goes flat. So we're just, we're just the, these, this kink in the thermal profile of the two gases, they have to miss each other just like a little bit. The amount of thermal energy that you have to pass during this condensation process has to be less than the heating of the water because we're heating from 20 degrees up to 100 degrees. If I take the heat capacity of the water times this temperature difference, a total of 80 C, that's the amount of thermal energy that we have to pass to our liquid water from the exhaust gas during this heating of the water up to 100 degrees. That heating has to be greater than the amount of energy that we're condensing. That puts a limit on how much liquid water can come out. That's what this little block is over on the left. It's a pinch analysis where I'm basically saying, what is the maximum amount of liquid water that we can have in stream 15 that is not gonna cause a pinch point in this heat exchanger? This is in red because I can potentially adjust this up and down to make it force it to be less than the, than the maximum. The other thing I can do is let the exhaust temperature in stream 15 be adjustable when I fix this at some value that's lower than the, than the maximum. I think the way this is running right now, that's what I've done. So at this point, I've calculated the maximum amount of con condensate. I can have at most 27% liquid water in stream 15. And I have said that I'm going to force it to be uh, 20%. That kind of sets the limit. That's the most amount of thermal energy we can possibly squeeze out of this, this whole thing. That takes us down to here. So I have the energy balance on the air heat exchanger. There's also an energy balance on the steam injector to just ensure that we don't get condensation going into the pre-reformer. Uh, there's the energy balance on the exhaust combiner. There's an energy ba balance on the waste heat recovery unit and there's an energy balance on the steam generator. That's where this, this pinch um, comes into play. So this is where I forced the 20% liquid um, in the final stream, and I'm, I'm then calculating the temperature of the exhaust stream, stream 15. Just to show you some of the differences between the hydrogen case and this case, one of the things you'll notice is that the split 
which occurs between the two exhaust streams is now actually now a higher percentage of that thermal energy has to go to the pre-reformer than it did before because we need some of that thermal energy to do the reef to drive the reforming process. That means there's less available thermal energy in heat exchanger three. And so we still produce quite a lot of thermal energy, but it's not as much as we would have if this had been running on hydrogen. And that's because we do have some endothermic fuel reforming. And then finally, in the waste heat recovery, this is the last step. I'm asking um, if I set the temperature in streams 14 and streams 13, according to the constraints on heat exchanger two and also heat exchanger one, what is the maximum amount of thermal energy we can pull out in heat exchanger three? Um, and that's what this number is. So 171 kilowatts of thermal energy can be recovered. And the temperature of that recovery, if I look at the temperatures of 13 and 14, it's somewhere between 300 and 200 at C. So if I have something I can do with that thermal energy at that temperature, then that's great. If you have a cogeneration application, awesome. You can get much more value out of your fuel because you're getting lots of electricity and you're squeezing out some thermal energy. Maybe you could heat a building, right? If it's winter time. And so some units are being sold like in the European market and in Japanese market, specifically with that idea in mind called CHP or you have uh, combined heat and power. So you generate electricity, you put it in a place where you're gonna need heat anyway, and you use all that waste heat in a, in a useful way.